so, Abba, Father, um, we cry out to you, help us to understand. God, there's a way that I can hear that song and it fills me with horror. There's another way that I can hear that song and it fills me with absolute wonder. Lord, help us to know the truth. Help us to preach in Jesus' name. Amen. Moses went to the mountain, and God spoke unto him. Moses, this is the Lord thy God commanding you to obey my law. Do you hear me? Yes, I hear you, I hear you. A deaf man could hear you. What? Nothing, I punished you, forget it. Oh, Lord, why have you chosen me? What would you have me do for you? I shall give you my laws, and you shall take them unto the people. Yes, Lord! Wow. Lord, I shall give these laws unto thy people. Hear me! Oh, hear me! All oh, pay heed! The Lord, the Lord Jehovah, has given unto you these fifteen. Oi. Ten, ten commandments for all to obey. <laughs> I love that clip. I think it's one of my all-time uh, favorite movie clips. Oh, Lord, why have you chosen me? What would you have me do for you? I ask that question all the time. And I know that you ask that question all the time because you ask it of me. What does God want from me? What does he want me to do? And to be fair, he has told us what he wants us to do, right? The Ten Commandments, you've read them. I mean, they're not a long read. But then you, you want some clarification. It's as if, you know, like maybe five of them are missing. Or 5,000 of them are, are missing. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. And you wonder, does that include, like, my Corvette? Number four, remember the Sabbath. And you ask, can I remember it while playing golf? Number five, honor your father and mother. And you think, ah, you haven't met my mom. <laughs> Number eight, you shall not steal. And you think, at last, I got one. And then he says, oh, by the way, everything that's anything is mine. Number 10, you shall not covet, you shall not want. And you think, well, what if I, you know, what if I really, 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 really want to not want? <clears throat> we all think we need some commentary on the law, some Mishnah. And that's what the Pharisees provided, laws upon laws upon laws, regulations about how to fulfill the law, how to be holy. People ask me all the time, what does God want me to do? They think that's why I went to seminary, and if I don't know what they should do, I should make stuff up. You know, give 10% to our church budget, don't go to R-rated movies, no heavy petting unless you're engaged, and uh, you, you can say poop but not shit. And you can say darn but not damn. And then they say, no, no, seriously, come on, Peter, I know, I, and I know what, what they want. I know what they want me to say. They want me to say something like this. Okay, to, really what he wants is for you to join a small group, one of our small groups. And he wants you to spend a half hour to 45 minutes in contemplative prayer, for which we have instructions, and you ought to volunteer down at the shelter. And you see, all that stuff is good, but I'm making it up. I do not know that that is what God wants you to do. But I can totally, totally, to so if you've asked that question, listen closely, I can totally, totally, totally relate to the question because I'm constantly asking the same question. God, come on! Seriously, I do not know what it is that you want me to do. Recently, I said to Susan, look, I don't know what it is that you want me to do. What do you want from me? 
Do I have to give you a kiss each morning? Do I have to buy you flowers on Mother's Day? Do I have to listen to you tell me about your conversation with your sister one more time? And, and she said, yes! But I sensed that she didn't really mean it, like there was some ambivalence in her voice. <laughs> and, and, and then she said, when I'm dead, you won't even miss me. And I said, yes, I will. I sure, you pay the bills. I don't even know how to pay the bills. The washer and dryer, I don't even know how, how they work, where to find all of our papers. And of course I'll miss you. And then she just screamed, tell you what, I'll write down the instructions for the washer and dryer, where to find all the papers, how to pay the bills, and then when I die, you can keep them all in a box with my bones and carry them around with you wherever you go. And I said, thanks. You're the best. (laughs) I didn't really say that. (laughs) To her. I'm just saying that we all want to know what to do, right? Moses wanted to know just what to do. Adam wanted to know what to do. Isn't that why he took the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? He wanted what we now refer to as laws, instructions, regulations. And it seems that we can't get enough of them, enough laws. I did a little research and it appears that there are at least 30,000 federal laws in the United States of America, but nobody knows for sure. That's just a guess. Whatever the case, we appear to want far more than 10. Well, Adam, humanity, wants to know what to do. We want the knowledge of the good so we can choose the good and make ourselves good. So in a garden on the holy mountain, we took knowledge of the good from a tree. And everything died. And then on the holy mountain that no longer looked like a garden, God gave knowledge of the good to Moses. He gave the law written on stone. And then it gets super weird. For he told Moses to put the law inside of a a box, an aron, a box that should never be opened, in a room that could only be entered by the high priest. And then he, and if you read Exodus, you read the Old Testament, you know this. He spends an inordinate, a ridiculous amount of time describing that box, the room, and how it is that anyone, actually only one, could ever enter that room. You would think that after he gave the law, he might tell them to post it in the courthouse, right? Like we want to do. And then perhaps train a bunch of lawyers and judges and policemen, but no, put it in the box. When I was a lifeguard, we posted the rules. No running, no glass bottles, no eating in the ool. Notice we left out the P, and you should do that too. We posted the rules, but how weird would it have been to write out the rules, keep them in a box, and then make sure everyone carried the box with them, but nobody could look in the box. Exodus 19, Moses and all the Israelites, they arrive at the holy mountain. Now, it's the same mountain on which Moses had spoken with the God-man in the burning thorn bush or thorn tree. Remember that we spoke about last time. As the ground shakes, a supernatural trumpet sounds, and the people of Israel tremble at the base of the mountain, God descends upon the mountain in fire, and he speaks to Moses, perhaps from the very same tree. He speaks the Ten Commandments. Moses listens, and, and Moses, I think, probably take notes. And God also uh, gives him some rules, but he doesn't write these rules in stone like he's going to do with the Ten Commandments, and they appear to be more specific to the Israelites. He calls it a covenant, and the Israelites agree to the covenant. In Exodus chapter 25, God calls Moses up the mountain again that he may, in order that God may write the Ten Commandments in stone with his finger. And then he starts talking about the box. Exodus 25, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel that they take from me a contribution. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution from me. 
And this is the contribution that you should receive from them. Gold, silver, bronze, blue and purple, scarlet yarns, and fine twine linen, goat's hair, tanned uh, ram skins, goat skins, acacia wood, oil for, for the lamps. And notice he didn't spell out the whole murder thing, right? But he's spelling all this out. Spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones and stones for setting for the ephod and for the breast piece, and, and let them make me a sanctuary, mikdash, holy place, that I may dwell in their midst. Now that's huge, because uh, in Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, God drives out the Adam, which means humanity, and in that place where Adam had dwelt, he literally, Genesis 3.24 in the Hebrew, makes to dwell the cherubim and the flaming sword which guard the way to the tree of life. The Bible Project does a good job of pointing out this connection. In Genesis 1, God creates an ordered world out of a dark wasteland by speaking in a series of seven days. Then on the seventh day, God's presence fills creation as he takes up his rest and rule. Similarly, the tabernacle and later the temple were built and dedicated in a series of seven speeches and seven days, after which the priest or king could rest and rule in God's presence. Ah, so all of creation is where God intends to dwell. It's like his temple. Exactly. Now, turn the page to Genesis 2 and we get another portrait of creation. This one focuses in on the land. And in the center of the land is a region called Eden, which in Hebrew means delight. And in the middle of delight, God plants a garden in which God and humanity live together. And that's why the temple was modeled after the garden, filled with imagery of gold and flowers. It's the place where God dwells with his people. So, humanity, Adam, is exiled from Eden, the holy place, but God says, to Moses, let them make me a holy place. And inside of the holy place, it looks like Eden. It even has cherubim, fire, and, and knives, the flaming sword. Now, you'll remember that the cherubim, fire, and sword guard the way to the tree of life that stands in the middle of the garden exactly where the tree of the knowledge of good and evil stands. Verse 8. And let them make me a sanctuary, a holy place, that I may dwell in their midst, exactly, exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture, so you shall make it. They shall make an ark of acacia wood. Let them make an ark, a roan. The last time that this word appeared in the Bible, which is also the first time that the word appeared in the Bible, is translated coffin. Because it clearly means coffin. And so the reader should first hear coffin. At the end of Genesis, Joseph, who remembers a picture of Jesus, he commands the Israelites to, upon his death, put his bones in a coffin and a roan, an ark, and carry them back from Egypt to the promised land with them. Exodus 13, 19, we learn that Moses and the Israelites are bringing the bones of Joseph with them, and now God tells Moses and the Israelites, like you made an ark for the bones of Joseph, make an ark for me. Verse 10, they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Shittim wood in Hebrew means something like scourged wood or pierced wood. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, a cubit and a half its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay it with pure gold, inside and outside you shall overlay it, and you shall make on it a molding of gold around it. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them on its four feet, two rings on the one side and two rings on the other. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold, and you shall put the poles into the rings on the side of the ark to carry the ark with them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark, they shall not be taken from it, and you shall put into it the ark of the into you shall put into the ark the testimony that I shall give you you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold two cubits and a half shall be its length and a cubit and a half its breadth and you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work shall you make them on the two ends of the mercy seat 
Make one cherub on the one end and one cherub on the other end. Of, of one piece with the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings. Their faces one to another toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. The testimony or witness that God is about to give Moses is the law. <laughs> Knowledge of good and evil written on stone with the finger of God. Here you go. Moses is to put it in the coffin and then cover the coffin, coffin with the kaparath. Most English translations translate that as mercy seat, but most literally translated it would mean something like place of atonement, for the word kapareth is built on the word kafar, which is normally translated as atone. Kafar describes what the high priest would do on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, when he would enter the most holy place and sprinkle sacrificial blood on top of the coffin containing the law. And as all Israel knew, the life is in the blood on top of the coffin. And as all Christians know, Jesus is the life and the good in flesh. In the New Testament, kapareth is translated with the Greek word hilasterion. In Romans 3.25, which we study, remember Paul told us that God displayed Jesus the Messiah as the hilasterion, the mercy seat or the place of atonement, through the faith in his blood displaying his righteousness. The mercy seat is also the judgment seat, which is the throne of God on earth where he is enthroned above the cherubim. Looks like this. Verse 21. And you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, the coffin, and in the coffin you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. There I, will, there I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. In other words, there I will tell you what to do. Then for about five chapters, God goes into all this detail regarding the tabernacle, which is also referred to as the tent of meeting. In an outer, in an inner tent called the most holy place, the Israelites were to place the ark. And between the most holy place and the holy place, between the inner tent and the outer tent, they were to put this, this veil. And outside the veil, in the tent of meeting, the bread of the presence and uh, the sevenfold candelabra, like the seven eyes of the lamb, and the altar of incense, and outside in the courtyard, the altar, and the fire, and the priests, and the knives, and the bowls for collecting the blood, etc., etc., etc. In Exodus 33, 7, we read this. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to, and this is interesting because it's going to be inside, he wants it inside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face. And now that's really interesting because God is going to tell Moses, no man can see my face and live. So I'm guessing Moses died, and yet he lived. And so he talked to God as a friend. You know, when I talk to my really good friends, ego doesn't get in the way. 
Verse 11, thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, which is the Hebrew form of the name Jesus, that's kind of interesting, right? Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. And now apparently this is describing Moses' conversations with God before the ark is built, for it's after this that God has Moses go up on the mountain once again to receive a second tap set of tablets, uh, stone tablets, because Moses had broken the first set in anger over Israel who had already broken the covenant, already broken the covenant. And it's at this point that God hides Moses in the cleft of the rock and shows him his glory, which is also his good or goodness. And as he passes by, the Lord basically says to Moses that he is constant forgiveness. And then he says that he will by no means clear the guilty. That is, no one will go unpunished, or better, undisciplined. It's what a good dad says to his kids. You are constantly forgiven. You cannot repay me for anything, for I have given you everything. But you will be disciplined, for I'm bound and determined to not leave you alone in your own illusion and failure. Finally, at the end of Exodus, they get the tabernacle built. Then Exodus 40, verse 34, this is the end of Exodus. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the, till, out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and the fire was in it by night, in sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. You see, it was how Moses and Israel knew which way to go. Not a map, but a presence. And the presence was the glory cloud and the fire. The fire on the tree on the mountain was the fire on the ark in the depths of the temple and tabernacle. And as I said last time, the tabernacle and the ark were like, they were like the bug zapper of God. No, Harry, no! Don't look at the light! I can't help it. It's so beautiful. Kind of reminds me of this. Get the mercy lid back on the coffin. In 1 Samuel, some Israelites look into the ark, like those Nazis looking for power and glory, knowledge, and they all die. In 2 Samuel, Uzzah tries to save the ark from falling, even though it's the ark that saves Israel from falling. He tries to save salvation. Sounds like a little bit of a Messiah complex to me. And the Lord, the Lord breaks out on Uzzah. King David is just filled with anger at the Lord for what happened to Uzzah, but later he dances uncontrollably before the Lord and his coffin, for it would appear that he's caught a glimpse of the other side. 
If you were to look behind the curtain in the temple, what do you think you'd see? You know, I think we have such a hard time with systematic theology. In other words, we have such a hard time understanding the Bible because we modern people no longer think in pictures. But pictures are worth way more than a thousand words. So the question I'm asking is, how do we arrange? I think most people just like dismiss all this stuff as freaky, weird, ancient crap. But maybe it's not. So how do we arrange the pictures? When Moses spoke face to face with God, what did he see? What did Aaron, the high priest, see behind the curtain? What did or does Uzzah experience in the Holy of Holies after his flesh is burned away? What did Moses see? He must have seen the God-man on the thorn tree, burning but not burnt, but, but no longer now on top of the mountain, now on top of the coffin, containing the law. And remember that it's Moses that basically compiled or wrote Genesis. I think he sees the tree in the middle of the garden between the cherubim. And on that tree hangs the good in flesh, who is the glory of God. And on that tree hangs the life, who is our Lord, Jesus the Messiah. In the Garden of Eden, on the holy mountain, that's what Ezekiel says, Eden on the mountain. In, in the Garden of Eden, on the holy mountain, Adam, which is humanity, which is us, listened to the liar and took knowledge of good and evil to make himself, to make us in the image of God. We attempted to justify ourselves, and the life died. The Word died. No longer alive, but dead, like words on a page. Or bones in a box. In the Garden of Calvary, on the holy mountain, Adam, which is humanity, which is us, listened to the liar and manifested the sin which lies in the depths of every human heart. We each crucified the Messiah. For we each have a Messiah complex. And we put him body broken and bloodshed in a tomb and turned the living presence of God into bones in a box. Or perhaps seed in the ground. And so God the Father raised God the Son, turning the tree of knowledge into the tree of life, or revealing that the tree of knowledge was always the tree of life. It's the tree that we usually call the cross. And so maybe Moses saw this. You know, to see this truly is to lose your life and find it. To lose your psyche and find it. It's to lose your Messiah complex and become the Messiah's complex. It's to die and rise with Christ, who is the slaughtered lamb, now standing on the throne and ruling all things in union with his Father. So maybe Moses saw this. And yet, that lamb looks kind of sad. Don't you? That's a sad lamb, don't you think? According to the Revelation, in the middle of the New Jerusalem, on top of the holy mountain, in the middle of the city, is the tree of life. And everyone, everyone, everyone is happy because it is good and everything is good and it is finished. So maybe saw this. Maybe Moses saw this. Yahoo! Victory! Or maybe, maybe he saw this. Can you see that? What's this? It doesn't show up very good in the, in the white there. This is God dancing on his own grave. <laughs> this is holiness. Holiness is not the list of rules kept in the coffin. <laughs> holiness is the life of love dancing on top of the coffin. Holiness is what happens in the holy of holies. This is the judgment of God. 
which is the commandment of God. John 12, 50, eternal life. Not a list of rules, but eternal life, freely dancing on top of the coffin. The bones matter, but only because they are encased in the body and blood that dances on the top. The law matters, but only because it describes the life of love. What you do matters, but only if it's encased in the body of love. This is the gospel of salvation, not what you have done, which is death, but what God does in you, which is life. Outside the tent, we can only see that we took his life on the tree in a garden. We can only see our sin. But inside the tent, we see that what we took has always been given. In fact, all things are forgiven. This is mercy on his throne, the righteousness of God. God consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. This is God dancing on his own grave, which is also your grave. Our ancestors often depicted the bones of Adam beneath the cross. For the legend was that Christ was crucified on a tree that grew from the seed of the tree of life directly over Adam's grave, which is why the spot was often called the hill of the skull, Golgotha in Aramaic, or Calvary from the Greek. They believed that the blood, you can see the skull at the bottom of the picture there, that's Adam's skull. They believed that the blood flowed down the tree and brought humanity to life such that as in Adam all die, so in Christ the second Adam will all be made alive. And that's not a legend. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. In Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel sees a whole valley full of dry bones, and God tells him that this is the whole house of Israel. And as Ezekiel prophesies, speaking good news, the bones rise, they're covered in flesh and blood, and God brings them into the promised land. Those bones are our bones. Israel of God, whole house of Israel, our bones that become his bones, the bones in the dancing body of Jesus the Christ. What Moses saw in the tabernacle behind the curtain on top of the coffin is called the atonement. And this is my point. That's how Moses made decisions. He didn't look at the law in the box. He stood in the presence of the one that dances on top. He didn't consult a map. He knew a presence, for the presence knew him. He was face to face. And now you say, okay, Nito, that's really cool, thanks, but what difference does it make? Where's the tabernacle now? Where's the lost ark now? And the answer is, exactly. <laughs> it's not there and then, it's here and now. In the book of Hebrews, we learn that the outer courts of the tabernacle, which is also the temple, represent the present age. Time as we know it. But the most holy place is the age to come, God's rest, the endless seventh day, where everything is good and it is is finished. And you see, that means that the most holy place encompasses all space and time, just as whatever is outside and before the Big Bang encompasses this entire universe. But in the death and resurrection of Jesus, eternity invaded time. Most of you have heard me talk about this lots of times before, but if you're new, I apologize, just hang in there with me. But scripture views time like this. Six days or ages surrounded by and being filled by the eternal seventh day. Time. And scripture views space something like this. We think of the earth as solid and full, right? And what matters is matter. Matter matters. That's what we think. Scripture speaks of the heavens as full and the earth as empty, and it speaks of God's plan for the fullness of time, which is to fill all space and time with himself, who is the very fullness that we all long for. You see, it's not only this world that's empty, it's my own soul that's empty. 
In other words, I'm full of myself. My soul thinks that it is the only thing that matters. So back to our question, where is the lost ark now? Where is the holy of holies now? Where is the kingdom now? Where is eternity now? Solomon wrote, he has put eternity in Adam's heart. Jesus said, indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Revelation eleven nineteen seventh angel blows his seventh trumpet, and then God's temple in heaven is, quote, opened, and the ark, the lost ark of the covenant, is seen within the Lord's temple. And then the revelation goes on to reveal what the New Testament clearly teaches, and that is, we're God's temple. <laughs> what a crazy picture. We are the temple that Jesus builds with his death and resurrection at the edge of eternity and space and time. So where's the lost ark? It's hidden in me. It's here and now, where eternity touches time, where decisions are made. Kierkegaard said, decisions are waking to eternity, something like that. Well, when I see Jesus Christ and him crucified, the curtain separating the most holy place from the rest of this empty old stone temple, the curtain separating eternal reality from this body of flesh that I have constructed in space and time, the curtain separating the Messiah from the Messiah complex that I refer to as me, that curtain rips from the top to the bottom and holiness gets out. And I get in as God begins to fill me with his life, which is our life, eternal life, even here and always now. So this is my point. The tent of meeting is in me. The atonement is in me. And it's how I am to make decisions, for the atonement is God's decision to make me and all things with me good. And that is not what most American Christians believe. And you can tell. When I was in seminary, I purchased Louise Burkhoff's Systematic Theology, which is like standard textbook for seminary. You had one, right, Andrew? Seminarians. In it, I learned that there was this argument between those that believed in, quote, an objective atonement and those that believed in, quote, a subjective atonement. If I understand correctly, an objective atonement is an atonement that is not dependent on you. In other words, it happens outside of you, and a subjective atonement is an atonement that does, that does not happen independent of you. In other words, it needs you in order for it to, to happen. The majority of conservative evangelical Christians vaguely believe in an objective form of atonement called the penal substitutionary atonement. In its common form, it's the belief that because of our sin, and to satisfy this thing called justice, someone had to be, quote, punished. And so God punished Jesus in our place in order to feel better about us. It would be as if, you know, um, me punishing, it would be like me punishing my oldest son, John, in order to feel better about my younger son, Coleman, as if that satisfied justice and made things right. Uh, C Coleman, I, I love you because I killed John. But in Deuteronomy 24, God says to Moses, each one shall be put to death for his own sin. In other words, no penal substitutes. It's just very clear. On the mountain in Exodus 34, God says to Moses, I am that I am, I am that I am, I am that I am, a God merciful and gracious, I am that I am means I don't change, okay? A God merciful and gracious, abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. That means something like, I will not let you go unpunished. I will not let you go undisciplined. In other words, everything is forgiveness, but I will not let you remain as you are. I suspect we've come to believe that because Jesus was punished in our place, it kind of means that he died so we don't have to die. 
that he suffered so that we don't have to suffer. That he gave his life away so we don't have to give our life away. In other words, that he loved and so we don't have to love. And so we produce Christians who say the sinner's prayer and think, hey, I'm objectively saved. And it doesn't matter that I'm subjectively untruthful, unfaithful, and unloving, utterly unaware that this means that they are objectively unsafe, for they have no subjective idea of what salvation even means. Some believe in an objective atonement, and some believe in a subjective atonement. That's the idea that Jesus' death on the cross was a mere example that we must emulate, or the decision of God that we must decide to accept with a decision of our own. But you see, either way, they believe that to be objectively saved, you must, be, you must subjectively save yourself, which makes you your own savior, which objectively speaking is not salvation. <laughs> but if the tabernacle is in your soul, It means that the atonement is objectively subjective and subjectively objective. Did I say that right? Objectively subjective and subjectively objective. The death and resurrection of Jesus, it happens independent of you, and yet you become entirely aware that you are constantly dependent on it. In other words, Jesus died in your place, but not so that you would be in some other place. In other words, he suffers for you, but not so that you would never suffer. He gives his life, but not so that you would never give your life. He loves, but not so that you would never love, but that you would always love with him. In other words, he dies with you so that he can rise with you and in you, and even as you, living his life through you, and through us, through all of us. Like we said last time, we are the Messiah's complex, his body. Perhaps the best way to say this is to say that when Moses looked into the Holy of Holies, he must have seen something like this. An extremely literal translation of John 1.18 reads as follows. No one has ever seen God. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, that would be the heart of the Father, he has made him known. God wants to be known and so it was, own, it was, it was, it was his own heart that was hanging on the tree in the middle of the garden. So how do you treat God's heart? He's giving us his heart. His heart is love, and love is a decision. He's giving us his decision. Another word for decision is judgment. Love is a free decision to bleed life and give life away. A heart pumps blood, that's what it does, pumps blood. To give life away rather than simply to take it and hoard it for your, yourself. God is love and love is life. And when everyone loves, it is eternal life. You cannot make love. But with every decision, love is making you. 1 John 14, 14. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the hilasmos. That's the atonement in the place of of atonement, the hilas carrion. The halasmos on the hilas carrion is the mercy on the mercy sent. He sent his, his son to be the hilasmos for our sins. To be love in every place where I have not loved. For love fills the entire law. It's everything God wants you to do. So when Moses looked into the Holy of Holies, he didn't look at the law in the coffin. Law is a description of love. He didn't look at the law in the coffin. He looked at the life dancing on top. The law is a description of love. Jesus is the life standing on the throne, which is the judgment seat of God. Now I see through a glass dimly, writes Paul, 
but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. God wants you to know him. But not as knowledge in a box. But the very life in your veins, the desires of your heart. He wants you to want him the way he wants you. You know, Susan does want me to kiss her every morning. Buy her flowers on Mother's Day, listen to her, tell me about her sister. But only, only if I want to. Only if her desires have become the desires of my heart. Only if I love her in freedom. Not as her slave, but as her husband. And that will only happen if I spend some time in her tent. And yet we're all terrified of the bug zapper. God's tent. And so God has hidden his tent in the depths of our souls. And God has sent his son to be our priest to lead us into that tent. So Jesus is the one that's revealed on the throne. And he is the priest that draws us to the throne in order to reveal his own heart. Hebrews 4.11, let us strive to enter that rest, seventh-day rest. That's the holy place where it is finished and everything is good. It's right there at the start of the Bible. Hebrews 4.16, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy to find help in time of need. It's, It's why we come here every Sunday morning. But you can do this all the time and any time. It's simply becoming aware of his presence in you and, and all around you. So sometimes I just sit and I repeat the word mercy, mercy, mercy. Sometimes I picture him sitting next to me on a beach. Sometimes I invite or I bring other people with me, people that I'm worried about, and we all sit there on the beach in my head and in in my heart. Sometimes I put my head on his chest like John the Beloved. Sometimes we read scripture together and I ask him questions like, what the hell is this? Sometimes we pray in tongues. But when I become aware of his presence and I picture the nail prints in his hands, I stop trying to justify myself. And I begin to believe I'm justified. I stop trying to be me. And I can just be who I am. The true me. And I can go to this place in an instant simply by saying, thank you. He's in charge of everything. Just by saying thank you or simply calling his name. And and when I live from this place, I begin to do what God wants me to do because I actually want to do it. In other words, I do it in freedom. With a free will. I'm really not making decisions so much as the decision of God is making me. In other words, I don't make love. Love is making me and revealing who it is that I am. In the Holy of Holies, God is giving me his heart. It's what he said to Israel through Ezekiel. I will take out of you that heart of stone. And I'll give you a heart of flesh. My flesh. And if you wonder why it hurts, well, then you've never experienced open heart surgery. Or forgiveness. It's not a cartoon heart. It's God's own heart. Jesus. Emma was a Jew who survived the Holocaust. Every day at 4 p.m., she would stand outside a church in Manhattan screaming insults at Jesus. She judged the king of the Jews to be a very poor messiah. One day, the pastor, Bishop C. Kelmer Myers, went outside and he said to Emma, Emma, why don't you just go inside and tell him? She disappeared into the sanctuary of the church. 
An hour went by, and a bit concerned, the pastor decided to check in on her. He, he found her lying prostrate before the cross, absolutely still. He bent down, touched her on the shoulder. She looked up with tears in her eyes, and she said quietly, After all, he was a Jew, too. If you live your life from that place, you will do exactly what God wants you to do. And you will go exactly where he wants you to go. And you will enjoy the entire journey, even if at times it really hurts. People may think that you are making beautiful decisions, but you will know that it's the decision of, of God that's making you. It's this <laughs> that's making you. For in the Holy of Holies, he says to you, This is my body, my flesh. Eat it. And this is the covenant in my blood. Drink it. Put it inside of you. Dark cup is wine. Oh, the brown cup's wine. Blue cup's juice. So, Lord God, we say that you are blessed. And that word means happy. You're happy, 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 happy. But God, we have to tell you, you do freak us out. So right now, if you would, maybe in the silence of your own soul, just pray these words with me. You can just pray it silently in your own heart. I'm not going to ask you to do anything that I'm going to see. But maybe you could just say, God... Even though you freak me out, I'm beginning to trust that you're good and that your glory is not your badness. Your glory is your goodness. And I'm the tabernacle that you want. And now say this in your heart, in the name of Jesus, I surrender the tabernacle. And I invite the fire. And now if you say, oh, well, what's going to happen? I don't know. I don't know. But it's good. And now in Jesus' name say, thank you. Amen. Now I need to say that this entire sermon is really just four words from the New Testament that I didn't have time to mention, so stay standing. But it's James chapter 2, verse 13. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That does not mean that mercy was ever opposed to judgment any more that your, than that your, your own body is opposed to your own bones. It means something like mercy dances on his own grave. <laughs> Do you see that it is my decision and your decision to put God in a coffin and all things with him? And yet it has always been God's decision to raise him in us, the coffin, and all things with us. When you see that you are forgiven much, you will love much. And when you love much, you can do as you please, much. For what you will want to do is exactly what God wants you to do. You'll begin to dance with him on your own coffin. You will know as you have been known. You will love as you have always been loved. You will become the dancing body of the Messiah. You will be what you truly are. 
the image and likeness of God. Believe the gospel. Amen. Hey, if you'd like prayer, Ted is awesome. He'll be down front. He would love to pray with you. Next week, we'll keep talking about this stuff. So hopefully he can come back. Have a great week.